Hey everybody, Taz from Critical Thinking Anarchist here. So a friend of mine posted this on Facebook today from the Daily Wire by Hank Berrien. Time Magazine says superheroes are like cops and should be re-examined. And of course, it caught my attention. So when I started going down, uh, I noticed that he linked the original, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but near the beginning of the piece, the author, Eliana Doctor Man, and if that ain't a perfect superhero alias, I don't know what it is. Eliana Doctor Man, what are you? I'm a caped surgeon in my uh, spare time. So argues that on-screen portrayals of police are often are too often positive. Writing legal procedurals and shoot 'em up action movies have long presented a skewed perception of the justice system in America. And I'm going with the wrong voice in this, but too bad. In which the police are almost always positioned as the good guys. These good cop narratives are rarely balanced out with stories of systemic racism in the criminal justice system. The bad guys they pursue are often people of color. Their characters undeveloped beyond their criminality. Jesus fuck. Seriously. In fantasy, and you better believe I'm going to be throwing up my uh, my Ben Affleck fictional characters pieces here. In fantasy, he's talking about how the good cop narratives are rarely balanced out with stories of systemic racism in the criminal justice system. No doubt because it's fantasy this is how people wished things were or how they wish them to be currently they superheroes were created to go beyond the law because they didn't feel the law did good enough so they came up with superheroes they did this because they wanted to you know because they saw the injustices in the world they saw criminals getting away with things that they should never get away with and cops couldn't do anything about it the the lawyers and the judges couldn't do anything about it so that's why this is this even exists why you know yes in a perfect world this is, this is supposed to be adding perfectness to the imperfect world that they saw So we'll go to the actual the actual thing here. We're re-examining how we portray cops on screen. Now it's time to talk about superheroes. In the past several weeks, as calls to defund the police have gone mainstream, pop culture critics and fans have been reconsidering how Hollywood heroizes cops. Hero that's not a word. Legal procedurals and shoot 'em up action movies have long presented a skewed perception of the justice system in America, in which the police are almost always positioned as the good guys. These good cop narratives are rarely balanced out, blah, blah, blah. We already read this, but. In this period of reckoning, the long running show Cops and the widely watched Live PD have been cancelled. Actors and writers who contributed to police procedurals are criticizing their own work and donating money to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Parents are protesting benevolent portrayals of canine cops in the children's television show Paw Patrol. And Ava DuVernay's film collective array is launching the Law Enforcement Accountability Project, LEAP, to project or to highlight stories of police brutality and counteract a biased narrative. But as we engage in this long overdue conversation about law enforcement, it's high time we also talk about the most popular characters in film, the ones who decide the parameters of justice and often enact them with violence. Superheroes! <laughs> Oh my god. Cops are okay. okay, yeah. The first one you're going to bring up is the Punisher. Of course you're going to bring up the Punisher because the Punisher was the extremist. The Punisher was was the anti-hero. He was never he was he was the hero who went too far. All pretty much every other hero cracks down on him in the Marvel universe. You know, anytime they did a crossover, it was always very, very reluctant because they didn't like the fact that he killed. They didn't like the fact that he used guns, that he went that far. But anyway. <laughs> they are beacons of inspiration. Protesters dressed as Spider-Man and Batman have turned up at recent Black Lives Matter demonstrations. And yet, what are superheroes except cops with capes who enact justice with their powers? 
Batman has no powers except for intelligence and money. He is actually technically not a superhero. He's just a hero. Spider-Man, yes, is a superhero. He was bit by a radioactive spider and uses his powers. But again, he is probably the most non-violent of all the mainstream superheroes. Because for the, I mean, whenever possible, he pretty much just uses his webbing to trap the bad people. He tries not to, he tries not to harm them in any way. Just lets you know, collects them after he's seen whatever they've done, and then holds them for the cops. With a few notable exceptions, more on those later. More superhero stories star straight white men who either function as an extension of a broken U.S. justice system or as vigilantes without any checks on their powers. Because they were created by little boys. Granted, at the time, you know, they were put into the media, it was, they were then, you know, adults. But they were created by little boys. And it's not that women couldn't do it. Women usually have, you know, young girls usually have a different imagination. That's not negative. That's just a fact. You know, most young women... You know, when you're talking about at the time that these characters were created, weren't thinking, how do I create, you know, if only there were some female character, some female superhero to exact justice upon the world. And again, depending on when you're talking about this, Superman and Batman created almost 100 years ago at this point. Um, obviously, most of the Marvel characters that we know were created by Stan Lee in the 60s. Or, you know, helped to be brought about to be created because Stanley didn't create all of them. Uh, you know, you're talking about working with Abby Arad and Jack Kirby and several others, you know, but you get the idea. It's just a different time of what was going on in the world then. So we'll go back to this now. Usually they have some sort of tentative relationship with the government. The Avengers work for the secretive agency, S.H.I.E.L.D. Batman takes orders from Gotham Police Commissioner Gordon. No, he doesn't. He works with Commissioner Gordon. He doesn't take orders from, <laughs> he doesn't take orders from Gotham Police Commissioner Gordon. He's usually the one telling Gordon what to do. Even the villainous members of the Suicide Squad execute government orders in exchange for commuted prison sentences. No, they're fucking forced. It's do this or die. That is literally it. It's the reason it's called Suicide Squad. It was to protect the superheroes. To put them in danger. So either they die because they go to this thing, or they die because they don't. It was It's a no-win situation. But it, again, Suicide Squad are not superheroes. They are anti-heroes doing heroic things because they're forced to do so. And even when superheroes function outside the justice system, they're sometimes idolized by police because they are able to skirt the law to get the job done. Yes, that's the point. The law, the law prevented the police from being able to do the job. Criminals don't follow the law. That's the whole point. When one side is bound by rules and the other side isn't, who's going to win? People saw injustice in the world. So what they wanted to do was have vigilantes, people who could bring about justice without having to worry about the law. So they broke the law to, to, to help the law. It's ironic, a little bit, but it doesn't matter. I mean, that, that, again, this is all... Um, this is all fantasy. In fact, real life police fo police officers sometimes adopt the symbolism of these rogue antiheroes. The Punisher, a brutal vigilante introduced in the 1974 Spider-Man comic, who also starred in a 2017 Netflix series, has become an emblem for some cops and soldiers. To the point where Marvel felt the need to address this idolatry in the pages of its comics. In a 2019 story, a group of police fanboys run up to the Punisher and say, We believe in you! One shows off a Punisher skull sticker on his car. The Punisher rips the sticker off and says, We're not the same. 
You took an oath to uphold the law. You help people. I gave up. I gave that up a long time ago. You don't do what I do. Nobody does. Another cop replies, like it or not, you started something. You showed us how it's done. It's fictional! Yes, I am sure there are some cops out there and some soldiers out there who truly do believe in it. And it is going to be literally a handful. Literally. But guess what? That's been going on for millennia. People who have who have power and who have the ability to hurt people will simply do so because they have the ability. The Punisher is representative of a larger problem in superhero narratives. God damn it. When Batman ignores orders and goes rogue, there's no oversight committee to assess whether Bruce Wayne's biases influence who he brings to justice and how. <sighs> no, but if a real vigilante exists, they would. We We actually have billionaires out there. We have people who are out there and doing these things, you know, who could do these things. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, Bill Gates even, if you really want to include him. I mean, we have people who have the money, who have the resources to be these people. Guess what? They're not doing it. The closest, the absolute closest we have that I can honestly think of is Elon Musk. What's he doing? He's doing his best to further humanity. That's what he's doing. Heroes like Iron Man occasionally feel guilt about the casualties they inflict, but ultimately empower themselves again and again to draw those moral lines. Okay. In the real world, meanwhile, tolerance... <laughs> The law enforcement acting with impunity is eroding. Well, yeah, because they're breaking their own rules. And they're doing it to people who are most of the time these people are nonviolent. It's not like, you know, it's not like these people are going around, you know, it's not like when a cop encounters a gang and has to fight them off because they are attacking him with weapons. And yet, you know, the, the people that they're going after, they're abusing their power and authority. You know, we don't talk about the ones who literally had guns. You know, we don't talk about the bad people who literally had guns and knives and whatever else, who wielded weapons against the cops and the cops had to defend themselves and take a life. We really don't talk about those You know, even the people who are like, you know, even the few times where it has happened in the past year or two years, you know, where the cops have gone to somebody's house and they have a knife, they have a what, you know, they have a gun, they have that, and people are like, well, they shouldn't have shot them, they should have tased them, they should have done them, whatever. But we don't talk about those ones. Why? Because ninety nine percent of the people in the world are like, sorry, in that particular case, the cops were right. They have to defend themselves. They have to save, you know, they have to do this for the greater good. Either that person is going to attack them or they're going to attack the person who's close to them, who's still in the house with them. The, the wife, the brother, the mother, the child, whatever it is, the neighbor. So that's why we don't chastise those officers when they're in that situation. We talk about the ones who do this to unarmed people. In the real world, meanwhile, tolerance is those calling for dismantling a modern policing point in part to the lack of consequences faced by officers who have killed black people like George Bush uh, without being fired or prosecuted, or at least with significant delays and public pressure before action was taken. And again, I've addressed that in a previous video, and there's plenty of uh, reason why that happened. As these urgent conversations dominate the news, it's increasingly unclear how 
Either the arm of the law or the vigilante narrative can survive without serious reconsideration. Why does the vigilante narrative need to be discussed? It's fantasy. Most of the blockbusters, most of the blockbuster Marvel and DC comics movies skirt the issue of who should define justice for whom. Captain America: Civil War and Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice briefly float the idea of superhero oversight, but both devolve into quick-filled CGI fistfights. In fairness, the Civil War storyline in the Marvel comics more thoughtfully plumbs the depths of that socio-political debate. Okay. Well, there's only so much you can do in you know a 10, 12, 20, 30 page comic. In the cartoons, kids just don't feel the need to, you know, they don't have the attention span for that. And in the movies, again, you, you're, you're constricted by time on what you can do. You don't have the ability to just sit there and be like, this is the way it should be. What's more, given that the creators and stars of these movies have historically been white men, it's hardly surprising that so few reckon with issues of systemic racism, let alone sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and other forms of bigotry embedded in the justice system, or the inherent biases these superheroes might carry with them as they patrol the streets or the universe. Again, this is supposed to be a near-ideal world. You notice most of the villains in these things are also white men. So... It's not like it's just white men going against white men, or, you know, it's not like it's white men going against black men or Asian men or women or trans or whatever. It's this, this is what they see in the world. Comics are like comedy. Comics are observation. And then you project your observation and expand it out. Look at the comics that have tried addressing in large formats sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and other forms of bigotry. In the past two years, how have those done? In the past five years, how have those done? In the past ten years, how have those done? They're usually on very limited runs. They usually just get canceled before the story is even done because the sales are so bad. new kind of hero. There is some history of reckoning with policing in black superhero films. What? No transition there! Outside of the new kind of hero, but okay. Wait, the 1998 Wesley Snipes superhero movie launched the superhero movie. Boom! We're still in today. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not saying Blade didn't do a good job. Didn't quite launch the superhero giving Marvel its first box office smash, the movie written and directed by white men. <laughs> References tensions between black communities and the police. In one scene, two cops walk in on Blade, fighting what is clearly a monstrous vampire and begin shooting at Blade instead. Blade turned around and asks, Are you out of your damn mind? It's played as a throwaway moment, but one thing, one that rings true decades on. Marvel announced last year that two-time Oscar winner I, I am so sorry, I, I'm probably gonna what's your name? Mahershala Mahershala Ali will star in Blade Reboot. I, I apologize for that. I mean, it's No, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in Blade. The may I don't remember. Let me see. It's been a long time since I've seen Blade, so I can't really comment intelligently on that particular scene. More recently, racial injustice has become the centerpiece for some superhero films. The clearest example of that shift is Black Panther, Ryan Coogler's 2018 superhero movie that takes as its main subject the, the oppression of BIPOC people worldwide. Um, no, that's, that's not the main subject, but okay. In that movie, Black Panther, a.k.a. T'Challa, 
Chadwick Boseman, Rules Over Wakanda, a secluded, scientifically advanced African country unfettered by colonialism. He faces off against a would-be usurper named Killmonger, Michael B. Jordan, who argues that Wakanda must abandon its policy of isolationism and help combat systemic oppression across the world. T'Challa eventually discovers that his own father and Killmonger's father had a similar debate in the 1990s. When Killmonger's father was deployed to America as a spy, he became radicalized by the racism he saw there. He smuggled weapons from Wakanda to help black people suffering in America. When T'Challa's father confronts Killmonger's father, the latter argues, Their leaders have been, their leaders have been assassinated. Communities flooded with drugs and weapons. They are overly policed and incarcerated. All over the world, our people suffer because they do not have the tools to fight back. Killmonger's father eventually loses his life for his political stand. <laughs> no! He loses his life because he was arming people without teaching them! He was, he was starting a global... He was starting World War Three. That's why he lost his life, not because of a political stance. You can't arm people without teaching them. If they don't know what they're, I mean, all at that point, all they're doing is just saying eye for an eye. Eye for an eye is not the answer. Kill for kill is not the answer. This woman is arguing that what we should be doing is killing each other to prevent racism. That is the, that is the crux of that paragraph right there. And she calls it a political stance. And I apologize for saying this woman, this person. I can't be sure. I shouldn't assume. T'Challa's arc is to realize his nemesis is right. No! That's not his arc. His arc is to realize that the world has caught up. But while they've been educating themselves on the world for the last several hundred years, whatever it's been, I don't remember again. While they've been educating themselves and bettering themselves, the world has fought in, fallen into violence. And yes, oppression, but that's not the point. The point is the violence. The point is that T'Challa wants to reach out, educate people, better people. And the violence. Well, Killmonger and his father broke laws and enacted violence for their cause. Yeah, this is the problem point right there. Their conviction that people of color have historically lacked the tools to fight systemic oppression was correct. No. Education is on both sides. T'Challa eventually comes to represent a compromise between these two viewpoints. He uses his relative privilege to empower... Relative privilege? Massive privilege! His country is very rich. They pretend like they're poor. He uses relative privilege to empower people who have been held back by colonialism and racism, but find, finds nonviolent methods to do so. Yeah. Yep, that was it. At the end of the movie, T'Challa opens a community center in Killmonger's hometown, Oakland. He asks his girlfriend to run a social outreach program for black communities and his tech-savvy sister to head up an education program. The same sorts of community investment that activists calling to redistribute police budgets into social support systems are now calling for. A Black Panther sequel is in the works from Googler. An audience can expect further exploration of this tension between policing and community support. Good advertisement! When superheroes and cops collide. Yeah. Suffice it to say, this entire thing is just essentially a hit piece. Okay, well, well yeah, we'll jump forward to here. 
the way forward. If Hollywood is to do better in telling these stories, more creators of color need to be given the reins to tell them. Then let them. They, then they should be the ones writing stories. Again, look at Marvel. Marvel gave a bunch of people, you know, non-straight white men, the opportunities to do so. Those stories fall on deaf ears. They don't sell. And it's not because it's non-straight men writing, writing them. It's because most of the people who are given the chance to do so are not talented. They don't write good stories. People don't want to be beaten through the head that they're racist, that they're bigots, that they're pieces of shit. They want to be entertained. Now, I mean, there and throughout comics, throughout media, throughout entertainment, there are plenty of ways to do that. But you have to be subtle. I mean, you can't, again, you can't just beat people in the head with it. You have to give them the chance to be entertained by it. If it's not entertaining, then it's not a story worth telling. And those of us who are old enough have been to our grandparents' and parents' houses when they do slideshows. Think of, that's essentially what those types of comics are. Your grandparents' slideshow. And you're just sitting back there, eyes rolling, falling asleep, not paying attention, and eventually just stop going. It's worth noting that while Lindelof employed a diverse writer's room, it likely took his name and cash as the creator of Lost and The Leftovers to get such an ambitious story greenlit. Probably not. I mean, that's just... That's projection. That's you saying that you think that's what happened. You have no evidence that. Find evidence. Go ahead and throw it out there. Similarly, while the director of Spider-Verse, Peter Ramsey, became the first black man to win an Oscar for animation, Sony initially approached the two white men who ended up producing the film, Lego Movie directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, with the opportunity to make an animated Spider-Man. Yeah. And? Lord and Miller are great storytellers. And they said, hey, we know somebody who can tell the story better. What's wrong with that? That's talented people hiring a talented person. That's what you want. Writers must also shake the notion that they are bound by the strictures of outdated intellectual property. I mean, there's nothing wrong with intellectual property being old. Stories are constantly being rewritten. Shakespeare rewrote Greek tragedies. And those are now several centuries old, and he was writing things that were several thousand, you know, several hundreds to several thousands of years old when he was writing them. He updated them for his time. We do the same thing now. It doesn't matter. You can write it for now. You can write it for the world that we live in right now. These days, few big-budgeted projects move forward unless they are based on existing IP. That's because they're expensive. And people don't like new for some reason. Believe me, I wish, most of us wish, that there were good new intellectual properties. It sucks having the same, you know, it sucks having Disney own everything and expanding those universes. It sucks that you've got DC constantly doing the same thing with the DC universe that Marvel does with their universe. It's boring watching the same stories over and over and over again. When something original comes along, it has to be marketed properly. And the problem with Hollywood in this particular case is that most of the time that they're going to put money behind something is against something that people know, not something that people have to get to know. 
but the success of Watchmen suggests that creators can snatch up those familiar characters and still weave a new story with new politics and a new perspective using only fragments of what came before. Yeah. And again, that's been done a million times. Look at Smallville. Look at the Arrow universe before it went woke. Heck, look at Merlin on the BBC. You know, it, I believe that came to America. That that literally took Smallville and rewrote it for medieval times. The creators even said that's exactly what they did. Look at Sherlock Holmes. The, the current BBC version of Stephen Moffat. That was a huge success. They took Arthur Conan Doyle's Hill's 18th, you know, 1800s stories and updated them to 20th century, which is not easy to do. Now, granted, I'm not particularly fond of how he did some of them, but for the most part, they did pretty well. Just as the Watchmen series is a radical departure from a dusty Reagan-era graphic novel, whatever, both Black Panther and Into the Spider-Verse borrowed the names and backstories of their main characters from the comics, but took those characters in new and ambitious directions. Yeah, it can be done. It's often done. The problem is, you need talented people to do it. And when you hire people based solely on their agenda you sacrifice talent which is why we don't see better projects coming across only when this creative freedom is encouraged and hollywood offers more opportunities to bipoc creators <sighs> and white creators use their capital to support oh In your own statement, you just said white people are better than people of color. Will we get more superhero tales that adequately grapple with the complexity of justice in America? It's not just America. It's the world. Dear God, this went on way longer than I planned on, and I apologize, everybody. So, yeah, I... Uh, that's the world we're living in right now. Somebody who just doesn't get it. Apparently this is America must change on time. And the first thing we're going to be changing is fiction. We need to change our fantasies, people. No longer can we imagine near ideal worlds where the thing that makes it better is someone who is beyond us anyway thanks for watching please like and share this please like and share the video <laughs> and uh subscribe for more content i'll talk to you later bye